this is so it's it is available for everybody. So if you'll notice down at the very bottom of our assignment, I've added in a chapter from another book. And so historically, this text or one similar to it has been a precursor to when we get into a programming class. Typically, in most degrees, we do something called programming logic or design, and we go through a lot of those concepts before we ever get ready to touch them in programming. And so this course has been um, really useful, and so I probably will throw some more pieces out of this this particular book. We're just using an old, I think they're up to like the 9th or 10th or 12th edition. This is an older version, so some of this, if it looks really odd, they talk about like a floppy drive. Remember that, but there really isn't a lot of differences. So it's another resource that we can have and covers some of the some of the similar types of, of content. So when we start looking at vocabulary, some of this is also a really great place to look at, at that vocabulary. So we talk a little bit about logic, we talk about syntax, and there's, for example, here where we talk about this coding cycle, in other words, where we're understanding a problem, we plan it, we write it, we translate it into the code, we test it, put it into production, and then we continue the cycle. So think about how many updates you get every week on Microsoft Windows or other programs or on your phone. So it really is a circular process, not a, hey, we wrote this program and we're done with it in most most cases. So uh, We'll come back and look at this, but I just wanted to show you where that was at really quick. Um, there are also some ways we can write things in what we call a flowchart that we don't really approach a whole lot out of some of the other items. So you'll see us reference some of those because it's a great way to kind of understand the world around you. And so pseudocode and flowcharts are something that I think are really important to understand. So if we can get down the pseudocode, we can translate that to about any other language. The other piece that happens is some of us are very much visual, and I suspect some of you are that way. Um, so the pseudocode maybe doesn't make as much sense as writing it as a chart of some sort, or what we're going to call then um, these flowcharts. So you can see an example of it in here with a couple of our symbols. And so we'll we'll work on some of those. I have a little trouble in here because I don't have a uh, touchpad or a screen I can draw on in here, but hopefully that'll make some sense as we start going. So when you do a flowchart, for example, which is, these are the same programs in, in pseudocode and in, let me make that a little bigger so it's easier to see. <clears throat> so these are the same thing in, in both pseudocode and in flowcharts. And so if we start with this idea that our program has a start and a stop, and we use the same symbol for both of them, that uh, elongated circle, or an oval, um, input and outputs are this rhombus, and then square boxes are when we do some kind of computation. So here we say we're going to start in fact, this program says, hey, we, we have the problem of we want to put in a number, and we want to times it times 2, and then we want to output that problem or that answer, and then stop. Well, that's part of this getting to know our problem. So we're, we start, we stop, and generally what I'll do is I will put those at the top and bottom of a sheet of paper so that I know where I'm at already. So I know I have a start, and I know I have a stop. The beauty of some of our programming languages is that once we create little modules like this with a start and a stop, I can then start plugging them in interchangeably into other areas. So, input, and in this case we just called it my number, and we're going to talk a lot about numbering and how we do things, but in this case we're just going to say input my number. Set my answer is equal to my number times two. Output my answer. Well, over here in pseudocode, the same thing looks like a start and a stop. And instead of having symbols, we use index. 
And this will become really important when we're in Python, because Python is one of the languages that uses indents to identify blocks of, of code. So here we indent and say input my number, set my answer is equal to my number times two, and output my answer and then a stop. So one other thing that we need to, to kind of have in our brain really quickly is this equal symbol. When you did math, and no flashbacks to college algebra, but in college algebra, if I said x equals 2, you're looking at that as, a, hey, those sides are equal. In our pseudocode and eventually in Python, the equal really means says, I want to take what's over here, and I'm going to shove it to the left. So my number times 2 gets shoved into this my answer. And so you'll see that over and over again. So equals is actually an active thing inside of our, our programming language. So I encourage you to read that, and then we're going to look at this a little more in depth once you guys have done that on Thursday, hopefully barring any sudden winter storms that we have. So that's one of our resources then this week that I need you to take a look at. Well, I also have some other pieces to look at here. Um, so let's look at process notes first, and then we'll take a look at this assignment. And we'll probably do this one kind of together just to make life, life a little easier. All right. So before we can do anything else, we have to figure out what is it we're trying to do. If I don't have my brain wrapped around what we're going to do, so think really quickly back. We're going to make a program that says I'm going to multiply a number times 5 and output the result. Well, I have to figure out the problem. I need to design that solution. So in other words, that's that pseudocode or flowcharts. And then I write it from those pseudocodes. Then I'm going to test it. To, hey, make sure it runs correctly. And then the last step is kind of the most important, I think. Because if we don't document things, we don't know what this program did a couple months from now or a month from now. Even. You won't know, oh, what is this value in here? So that documentation becomes really important because other people are, in most cases, going to maintain your, your code. So there's a lot of terms in here. And the scariest one is this one here, algorithm. And an algorithm is just a set of operations to solve a problem. So I wake up in the morning and I don't smell so fresh. My problem is I need to take a shower. So a set of step-by-step -step operations on how to take a shower is an algorithm. And so we've all done these things. You don't jump into the shower fully dressed. You go through an entire process. Probably some of you have some really interesting rituals in terms of I have to brush my teeth first. I have to do this. Those are all that idea of that step-by-step -step operation. Um, so when I look at my programming, one of the terms that I think is to be very important is this idea of something called syntax. So syntax is that I have written something incorrectly in my code. And you'll see error codes that will say my syntax is off. So there are rules, just like there are English or Spanish or any other language. Well, there's rules for uh, different programming languages. And so we'll see. We'll run into that a little bit. Um, so kind of the key ones. We really need to figure out what this problem is. And this is, quite frankly, in some ways, the hardest step. How do I solve a problem without identifying it first? So I have to figure out what exactly my problem is. What do I need out of it? What's the reason? What Maybe I need to sidestep a little bit. So we run reports and, and create programs, essentially, to look for specific students and themes and ideas that are going on in our class. So maybe we want to create a program that looks at pulls all the names for students that were enrolled in spring or enrolled in fall, and then pulls a data check and says how many students were enrolled in, 
in spring, and it takes a look at those and says, what's our percentage of students that then stay in the college? Oh. So we call that our, our, our fall to spring retention rate. So we'll take a look at that and create kind of a pseudo code for it. So a lot of times we look at this solution and we break it down from big problems to smaller and smaller problems. And we do that in our own life. When you get a 25-page paper assigned in some course, you don't just sit down and start writing that. You break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. So a lot of times, projects are even broken down with multiple people. So once I can break that down, I can assign that to multiple people to solve this problem. So there is typically not one person who writes all of the software code for a program. One person didn't sit down and write Windows 11. There's a team of people. Uh, so this is a sort of decision making. It's not a really good flowchart, but it, it gets the point home of a couple of things. One, we can only really ask questions with two decisions right now. And that happens to do at, a, at the very basic level, our computer is nothing more than a set of on-off switches. So can I go to the movies? Well, no. All right. So it doesn't really matter at that point anything else because everything else feeds out of it, right? So, do I have homework? Yeah. Can I get it finished on time? Yes. And do you have money? Yes. Go to the movies. So, this is an idea of where we have a couple of different steps in here. So we need to also look at a couple of other little conceptual things. So most languages, including Python, have some variables involved. And one thing about Python, they don't have to be very short. We can make them longer and more descriptive, but there's a balancing on it. We don't want to use up all 255 characters for a student name. But we need to come up with something um, consistent in our naming schemes. Part of that is if other people are all working on it, we all have a very consistent name. So in this particular case, they used an underscore between first and last name, student and number. Grade, they didn't have to because, hey, guess what? It also noticed they all start out with a lowercase letter. Okay, so that's one method that we can do. We'll show you another one called camel casing, which is kind of what I tend to do or prefer, but that's just me. Debugging is really trying to find all the issues in your program. So one of the things I'm always challenged with is people that work till the last minute, and they write a program, and they turn it in, and they didn't even try it to run it and see if it's going to run. So... Make sure your programs run. Check the errors and use those warnings. And, and when we get to that a little later on, but debugging is really a critical step, figuring out what's wrong. That's where you'll also drive yourself crazy because it can sometimes be as simple as a semicolon instead of a colon or vice versa, and your brain knows what it should be. So sometimes you do have to do that walk away, walk away. All right, so maintenance. So... We're going to look at how do we document inside of Python, how do we document inside of other languages. So I'm going to have you open up Notepad with me, or scribble on a sheet of paper, either one. And Notepad works really fine for this. So remember, this is a program to find the percentage of retainees or retain students fall to spring. All right, so, and I'm going to show you, I'm just going to use a double slant to tell me that it's different. There's other different languages have different ways to do it. So we could do it that way. Whatever makes you comfortable in your pseudo code. So that means that's not part of the program. It's just our documentation. So, I might have you go, 
something like that. So you've got your name inside of these things, all, all kinds of things when you start doing it. But our find a percentage of retained students fall to spring. So a couple of things I know I'm going to need. I'm going to need a start. And somewhere down here I'm going to need a stop, right? So I have those in there. So think about if you've had the HTML class, that's your beginning and ending of, a, of an item. So everything after that is going to get indented. So that block will all run together inside this start to stop. So everything should be indented at that point. So we said we need a couple of pieces of information. So we need to get Now, I could have just said, hey, we need to get the number of students. Why would that be wrong to figure out our percentage of retained students from fall to spring? Do we have new students on campus in the spring? Yeah, so it would skew that number to a higher result. So what we want to do, and we're going to imagine in our world, because we haven't yet had to apply it, that we're going to be able to do this. So we're going to say, Input fall student, and maybe we use instead of student names, we have something here that was individual for every student. What what thing is that? N U I D. Ah, and I'm going to say as And so I use the underscore notation there. So this is going to be a variable that's going to hold all those NUIDs together. So we'll work on the mechanics of that later. And so now I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to say input spring student NUID as spring list. Okay. So now I need to compute, and so what I'm going to do to compute is I'm going to do this. I'm just going to say subtract, or let's see, I'm going to call it unique, and I'm going to set it equal to minus Spring list. Okay. So now we shoved all the students who we've lost into a pool. Okay. So now I have to do a couple more trans transformations here a little bit. So I may have to have fall count is equal to a count of fall list and then I have a spring so now I have a set of values and I have this pool over here so I probably also need then to the unique count equals All right. so that gives me a lot of numbers to deal with does that make sense maybe I can make it I see you're squinting there a little bit yeah, I can't do that. All right. All right. let me do that see if I can make this bigger for you now Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right. All right. So, and this is just a far-fetched piece. We'd actually have some other things to do in here, but I somehow managed to input this false NUIDs and the NUIDs as spring list. So, a big structure holding all those values. So, think like an Excel spreadsheet holding all those. I then created this input. I, I modified it a little bit. I said, which ones are unique? Because I may want to also print out a number of students that 
are not here, and maybe we could find a reason why. We could do a survey with them or something else. So I have a lot of data here. Now I may want to output some of that data. So I'm just going to say output, but it could be to the screen, or it could be wherever. It could be on a printer. So output, and we want to find the percentage, right? Output. So if I put it in quotes, what that lets me do is say, I'm going to actually put that up on the screen or the printer or whatever. I'm going to separate that with a comma, just like we do in Python. So I can also say, I want to output a value. Now, I may decide to make it easier. We can put those math operations in our output, but maybe it's a little cleaner to look at this first. And so we know that is then, well, how would we figure this percentage? So our, our spring value So we have to do a little bit. Right. So we want spring our count, right? Minus our unique count. Divided by our fall count, right? Does that make sense? Um, if I just did, um, actually that's, hang on, that should be fall count there. Um, if I just did spring count and divided by fall, it would include any new students in the spring. So actually that needs to be fall count. Fall Count minus unique count. So unique tells us the ones that have dropped off the radar. So I can see how many started at the semester and how many are left. So for example, I'm going to just throw a couple numbers up here. So if we started out the semester in the fall at 100 students in fall, and we knew that in spring we had 75 students. If I just looked at that, I would say, oh, we had a, a 75 divided by 100, a 75% retaining. But if I look at those unique ones, and it equals 35, that means what we actually did was gain 10 more students in the spring. So that wouldn't be the right percentage. It would actually be 100 minus 35 divided by 100, or 65% uh, retained. And since we value so much on that retainage, and part of the reason we do that is you've worked at any employer, it's easier to keep an existing employee that you've already trained than it is to replace them. Well, same with students. We want to keep you around. We've invested effort, time, money, and you guys have also done the same, so hopefully we can find a way to keep you in here. So that's why we, we do it that way. It, it makes it a little more, look a little more complicated, but and now to make it a percentage, we'll just say as percentage. So we'll just do a tax. We'll, we'll, we'll call it as a tax. So fall, so in this case, if I had those numbers, it would be 100 minus 35. So 65 divided by 100 or 65. Does that make sense? And then we put in the value here. Percent retained. So there we're outputting the variable. So this is our text. And then we add to it this number that we get out of our program. What this does also, though, if we wanted to add additional things. So we got all this. We solved our original problem. But maybe we also want to print out some of those other numbers. So we want to output that unique 
value. So in other words, all the students are NUIDs of students who didn't stay retained. So then we might be able to use that for something. And that's the really great thing about this. Once we created this, that it works, then we can start modifying it to, to change our needs as we go. So I'm going to tuck this up over here for a second. So anytime we get input, outputs, those kinds of things, it's kind of nice to say, how do I get that? And so here we might put, From, and we could include details, all kinds of things. So the more documentation you put in there, the better. Because when you go to look back on it, or more importantly, if you want to be pragmatic, in this class, when I look at your stuff, the more details, you get, and I say, oh, I see what you're trying to do. Let me help you tweak that a little bit. So this is an example of that pseudo code. And Honestly, when we start getting into the Python itself here next week, you're going to find that this looks very, very similar. Very, very similar. So hopefully, because it's so English-like, that makes sense. I don't require, there are some classes that are very strict, and they have rules for pseudocode. As long as you can understand and I can understand, I'm, I'm fine with it. However, if you get hired on by, you know, some giant corporation like GE, and your job as a business analyst in between, you might have a very structured pseudocode that then goes into the program. So, uh, documentation, documentation, documentation. I will yell at you all semester long about documentation. All right. So there is a real quick assignment for this programming process. All right. So this one's due Sunday. So let's look at the program and maybe we can do part of it at least here. So you're creating a cartoon to help middle school students understand the programming process. Make sure you include all five of the steps. Okay. So taking our lessons before, choose a presentation software. So most people are just going to grab PowerPoint um, and then either create a book, a presentation, some document. So you can use about anything. So if you put it into Microsoft Word in Office 365, you can post a link as long as you have it available to do that. So they list several in here, Google Slides, PowerPoint, um, any kinds of things you want to do. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot, there's some instructions on that. And I will say that's changing just a little bit if you have Windows 11. Even Windows 10 now, they're popping up this thing about changing the snipping tool. So just be aware of that. Uh, I love this tool. So this is one of my favorite tools in the world is I can grab pieces and I can throw them in somewhere. So, that's your, okay, that's my physical one. Come back. Yeah, right. So, that is your first assignment for this week. Alright, and then there is a process quiz. And again, these are short, simple, and I think everybody that did them did really, really well. And I think right now I've got it set where you can you can actually do them. <coughs> bless you. I can bless you multiple times if I remember correctly. So uh, this one really just is asking about questions from the very short little slideshow in there. So nothing horrible. Just forcing you to make sure you read and look at some of the other objects. All right. There are a couple of other things we want to look at. And one of them I want to talk about is... is that it done? So, documentation of your code. All right. So, 
I'm going to yell at you about documentation over and over and over and over again. If the very first thing in your program is a, a documentation line telling you what you're doing, you're probably going to have an issue. Just because I want to make sure that I know what you're trying to do. This white space, as we call it in Python, is free. You can use as much of it as you want, and it doesn't affect your program at all. So, document, document, document. So, every assignment when we're doing it in Python should have your name in. It should have the assignment. When you are stepping through pieces of it, it should tell me how I got there. Because I figured this out, but what I really should have, use fall minus unique to avoid new spring students. So now I've added a piece in there. Uh, so in most languages, you can put something on a single line. Maybe you want to put it down on its own line above or beyond or wherever you want to run it. But you can always document it every language. Yes, it makes your program look longer. But when you come back and you're trying to figure this out, because if you if I gave this to you and then two weeks later I said, hey, what, why did we create this formula to count these separately? And then, Aha, here's my, my long note about why we did that. So those kinds of things are really, really, really helpful. So the other piece up at the beginning, and we don't, we don't have to do this in Python, but it's very handy to do. So especially in the pseudocode to understand what's going on, I like to do this. So the languages differ a little bit on how we declare variables. Some languages we have to declare them at the beginning of our program. Python is very nice to us and just says, oh, you can just make a, a variable of any kind you want. We're friendly. That said, I still like to make a list up at the top, even in Python. And there's a couple of reasons I like to do that. As I start working, a lot of times I'll find myself cutting and pasting variable names and things, and I want to make sure I'm always using the right one. So if it's setting at the top of my program, it's very, very easy to do. So most languages have something like this. Declare, let's see, fall list as, okay, let's call it a two. We haven't talked about what a tuple is yet. Now let's let's just call it a list. So that's a specific kind of of variable, and it'll allow you to store multiple items. Python is really nice and doesn't make us declare the type until we use it. And when we use it, it automatically says, "Oh, this is what that variable should be." Most languages we have to do a couple of different types. So, most of them have some kind of a numeric. So, we can declare a value as a number. So, that'd be a single number. They may do it as some kind of uh, text item. So, in other words, so many characters of text. Some break it down with long text. So, short text may be up to 256 characters. Long text may be 256. 55 to 4,000, those kinds of things. Even in the numerics, we sometimes have to break them down. So some of them are integers, or we may have decimal, or other types to declare those. So Python really is nice to us. We don't have to do all of these, these processes. Where it becomes a bit of an issue is then if you go to a different language that does, you go, oh, I'm not used to that. But I like to declare up at the top, even if it's just in comments, what all these values are. The other thing I like to do, so we're going to declare, what did I call it? Uh, percent retained. And I'm going to say as percentage. So 
maybe there's a, a type of value that's stored as percentage in this language. The other thing I'm going to do up at the very top is I'm going to declare it a value for it. And in this case, I declared a zero. Sometimes we go into a program knowing there are things that have a value that we're going to use. In this case, we're creating it, and we put a value in here. But what I'm never really sure of is where I'm assigning this value, is that really set as zero ahead of time? So I kind of call this like a garbage collection. So go ahead and make sure that value gets set correctly. Because what I'm really doing, even though we say I'm calling it a name, what we're really doing is going into an address. And so our computer's got all these address buckets. So they're they're listed in order. And so if I think I'm going to use this, this individual cell, but it's already got a value in it, that could paint what I'm doing. So I declare it as a zero, I wipe it out, and I make sure we're in. And so we'll talk a lot more about memory in pieces, but think of it like an Excel spreadsheet. Every one of these can hold a value of either a zero or one or a byte or we have more of those. So it's just kind of a garbage cleaning idea to go ahead and declare those all at zeros. Now, there may be ones I don't. So if I declare mile as numeric, so in that case, I declared it at a value. And typically, if I'm going to declare a value at the very beginning, it's going to be something that we're going to use that we think of as a constant. In other words, it's the same all the way through the program. Nowhere in there does a mile change, I hope. That would make life confusing for all of us. So it's used all the way through there. The way we're going to, to kind of also identify that as a, a constant is we're going to capitalize it up. So when I say declare mile, when I look at that program, I go, oh yeah, that's a constant, it's going to stay there. So if I'm doing stuff in chemistry, there are a lot of constants. If I'm doing work in physics, there's constants we need to have. And that's a good way to do that. So mile as a number is equal to this, and we think that it's constant, it's not going to change. Does that make sense? Quiz should be no problem. I want to look really quickly at this one. All right. Problem solving. So there is a video here if it still links. Oh, never mind. I don't want to do that. I'll take that back out then. Um, We've all seen a Ruby's Cube. Does anybody in here solve a Ruby's Cube for fun? No. No? You can get frustrated, pop it apart, and rearrange the pieces? Oh, okay. So you solved it, but you used a little different methodology. So we want to look and think about things a computer can do, this algorithm. So when I think of a computer, I know it can do math operations, right? So we've looked at pseudocode, we've looked a little bit about flowcharting, so you guys have got most of this together already. So all of these things, if you have a recipe or an algorithm how to do it, you can, you can do that. So typically this is the kind of things we need to do to make a program. We're going to get data doesn't have to be from a person, it can be from another program, another file, from a thermometer, whatever it is, we're going to get that data. We're going to process it in some way. So our example here, we got data. So these steps were creating data. And now we started modifying it. So these are our algorithm pieces here. And then finally, we're going to put that out or send it somewhere for storage. 
So, so some kind of form called an output. Could be on screen, could be sending it back to a file, whatever it is. So we have input processing output, and that's really what defines having a computer and a program. So, there's some toast examples. So, oftentimes what we run into is there is no right way to do things. Okay. And that's one of the things that's a little scary about this class is, as we start to develop things, there isn't always one solution. And in fact, what happens when I see every student coming up with exactly the same solution? It tells me it's out there on Chegg or Coursera. But there are always different ways to do things. Typically, we'll tell that different ways and different people will come up with, we can almost kind of see a signature of how they're able to program and look at things. So, we want to find a solution to a problem. So, if I say, here they're using Fayetteville to Raleigh, but if I said Omaha to Kansas City, are there multiple ways to get from Omaha to Kansas City? Yeah. Yeah. Now, most people would say, well, I'll take 29 down, but what if you don't like driving on freeways? Can I take 75 highway down and then jog across and do all? Yeah, I can do that. So, most of the time, there are multiple ways we can solve a problem. Okay, I want you always to remember that. So, from my side, when I see two people's work that looks identical, it makes me very sad because, oh, you guys have worked together and had exactly the same idea magically. So, oops. All right. All right, let's talk about last week really, really quickly. And so, I think almost everybody introduced themselves on the online section. Um, and then you were, your history of computer programming. There were some really interesting pieces in there. So, uh, make sure if you haven't that you go through and look at several other people. Your instructions were to respond to others. I have not went through and graded them on that yet. On this one, I'll probably grade mostly on did you turn in uh, something. So, uh, make sure if you haven't, you send me an email and say, oops, I screwed that up and I'd like my one pass extension on it. So, this is our one for problem solving tools. So, it'll pop up here. You can get to it from here or from the modules, either one. When I glanced at the assignments from last week, um, so there was the uh, ethics and, and programming one, they all looked really good, at least when I just glanced at them. So I will be working on those after this class, trying to put in all the grades for those. And then we'll have a couple of pieces this week. So Thursday, we're going to finish up talking about processes, and we're going to look at this programming logic book in a little more depth. We're going to write, practice writing some more pseudocode and throw that out there. And we're going to show you how to install Python so that we're ready for the week three. So we're going to probably dig in a little bit into Python. I want you guys to play with it a little bit and figure out what all kinds of devices everybody wants to put it on or is trying to put that on. All right. Any questions? Comments? Notes? <laughs>